Uh, we are in a series right now. We started last week. Why revival waits? Why revival waits? And I could put a definition behind the word revival. It would really be this, this knowing of the manifest presence of God. And it's not just a one-time thing. It's not just a visitation of the presence of God. It's a habitation of his presence. And here at Journey, it's really what we're after more than anything else. I'm sorry. I want a habitation of his presence more than anything. We've had people say this, and it's the biggest thing that I could ever want. It's the, it's the biggest compliment, but I want more uh, reviews like this, that as soon as they come up on the parking lot, that they sense the power and the presence of God. Like that's what we're after. Like there's this undenying knowing that God is in the room, that God is in the place, and that is what my heart burns for. And so we said this last week, why revival waits is this, it's not God waiting, it's not us waiting on God to bring revival, it's God waiting on us, he's waiting for his people. And I came to this revelation back a couple of years ago, and the Lord just talked to me so clearly, I remember in a time of prayer, and he said, you know, Adam, I want revival even more so than you do. Like, I want it more than you do. It's the, but he's, what he's doing is he's preparing our hearts for it. He's preparing our lives to be able to receive this move of God because what would happen if he just poured out his spirit but we didn't pay a price for it? We would think that it has something to do with us. But it takes ultimate and complete humility before the Lord. And so last week we looked at this parable in Luke 18 and this what Jesus told him uh, is a parable of the, of the widow woman who had this unrelenting prayer. And what prayer does is it gets you to a place of humility and just a heart for the Lord. That's what was the point of the parable. But she prayed this very powerful prayer that I feel like the Lord really spoke to us about and is for this year. And she prays this prayer, get justice for me from my adversary. And I believe it, this year the Lord spoke to me, I felt like in my time with, with him as I began to really unpack that scripture that the things that were stolen in 2023, that God wants to restore them, but also restore them with interest in 2024. But we have to be people of prayer. It's not just going to come because we pray one prayer one time. It's the unrelenting prayer. This widow woman was unrelenting with coming before the Lord. Why? Because she came with humility, knowing that he was her only hope. It's when you come to this place of just desperation for Jesus, it's when it begins to happen. And so we looked at 2 Chronicles 7.14. It's an incredibly popular passage. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. I just want to take a moment to encourage you this morning. Humility. Humility comes with fasting. Fasting is the quickest way to humble yourself before God. Amen? And that's what we're in. We're in a season of 21 days of prayer and fasting. Without prayer, you're only dieting. And so we're in the season of prayer and fasting. If you've you know, you, maybe you set out to fast this past week and you've messed up a time or two. I just want to encourage you. I mean, his grace is sufficient for you. Just get back on the wagon the next day and keep on doing it. Don't get beat up by it. If you failed one time, it's okay. Just keep on fasting. And, and just come to a place of repentance. Lord, I, I messed up. I'm sorry. Help me. Lord, I'm weak. Help me to be strong. Yeah. So if my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray that unrelenting prayer of this widow woman and seek my face. Whenever I hear that phrase, seek my face, I'm reminded of David. God said to David, David, will you seek my face? And David said, Lord, your heart, with my heart, God, I will seek after you. I'm paraphrasing there. So if my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. That's what I'm talking about this morning, turning from our wicked ways. 
Then I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. I don't know about you, but inside of every single one of us, there's wickedness, there's sin. I don't care who you are or where you're at this morning, there is wickedness and sin. We're going to talk more about that this morning. We're going to unpack that. Um, I've entitled my message this morning this, Radical Obedience. Radical Obedience. If you like my notes, you can text notes to the numbers on the screen behind me and get those and you can fill in the blanks and have that and even mail them to yourself and have them during the week. But let's pray. This is a heavy message this morning. I'm going to go ahead and warn you now. As I was preparing this, I just found myself honestly just repenting before the Lord. So I really just want, before I pray, I want to, I want to ask you to do me a favor this morning. While I'm praying, we just ask the Lord to give you a humble heart. We ask the Lord to give you a humble heart to be able to receive this today. Be able to receive his gaze that he wants to look upon your heart and examine. And as you kind of take this in today and self-examine yourself, I believe the Lord wants to get rid of some stuff in your life. Just as I believe that he's getting rid of stuff in my own life as well. Let's pray. Father, we come this morning. I come this morning, God, with such a broken heart. Lord, would you give us a contrite heart? Would you give us a desire for only you, Jesus? Lord, as we invite you in this morning to really look at us, would you show us, Lord, the places, God, that you were calling us deeper into, Father? The places of sin, God, that may be hidden to us, Lord, would you bring us, them up to the surface, Lord? Lord, our, our, our one pursuit, our one journey is just after you, Father. So, Lord, would you come and would you show us, God, Lord, we want to walk in obedience, just as we saying, God, you are holy. Lord, you are holy. Lord, you are holy. And to be able to stand before a holy God, we must be holy, so, but it's only underneath the blood of Jesus, and we recognize that. And Lord, we thank you for your grace, God, that empowers us to overcome sin. We love you so much, Jesus. We love you so much, Jesus. You just say this before we get started this morning, Lord, give me a humble heart. Just say it again, Lord, give me a humble heart. Yeah. God, would you give us a humble heart this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I know this is a little, it feels already heavy in the room, but there, there's things that we want to do, but we just don't do them. I know my own life, it can be that way, where I want to do something, but because of something else, I just don't do them. I think of New Year's resolutions when I think about things that we want to do and we set out to do, but for whatever reason, we don't, we don't do them. Some of the top things that are New Year's resolutions that people set out to do at the beginning of the year is, one, is to lose weight, right? We all want to be a little skinnier than what we are. Um, to eat healthier, to exercise, to save more money. We all set out to do those things. And I read a stat this past week that by mid-February, 80% of people completely abandon their New Year's resolution. By mid-February, 80% of New Year's resolutions saying, I want to do this, I'm setting out to do it, but for whatever reason, I'm not going to follow through anymore. It's too much, it's too hard. You know, there, there might be different reasons for that. Uh, one may be that the goal set was, just, was, was, was too high for them. The bar was too high. Maybe a, a circumstance came up in their life and it just kind of felt like too much for them. And they set out to do this thing. It was a good thing, but they didn't end up doing it. Paul talks about this in Romans, that he doesn't want to sin. He doesn't want to do these things, but yet 
He comes back and he continually does it, does it over and over again. Like it's just, I just want to, I, what I love about Paul is his transparency, yeah? That he's saying, okay, I, I'm, I don't want to do this anymore. I, I don't want to fall into this trap anymore, but, I, but I, Lord, I keep on doing it. Maybe you're in this room today and there's a, there's a trap of sin that you're saying, man, I don't want to do that anymore. It's ugly, it's disgusting, but I keep on doing it. I did, as I was examining myself this week, I just found myself even thinking about my own life and stuff. And, you know, I, in this season of my life, I've really struggled with greed here recently. I find myself often looking at the investments that I've made on my phone and kind of getting my head wrapped around these things. And there's this greed that comes in to my life. And I'm like, Lord, why is that there? I don't want to deal with this anymore. I don't want to continue looking at this instead of looking towards you. Maybe you're here this morning, you're struggling with sin. It's a sin that you repeatedly go through. It's, it's, uh, maybe it's lust, maybe it's um, gluttony, maybe it's uh, laziness. I don't know what it might be this morning, but there's a sin you keep on going through. And this is what Paul was talking about here in Romans. Let's read this. And again, I love his transparency. He says this, for what I am doing, I do not understand. <laughs> Why do I keep on doing this, Right? For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. Have you come to a place in your life where you just hate your sin? If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law. That is good. The law is good. But now, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, that I know that in me nothing good dwells. For to will is to present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Listen, the law of God is not the issue here. The indwelling depravity of man is the issue. Because inside of each of us is the desire just to please ourselves. Is it not? If we're really real of ourselves, it's the desire to please ourselves, to please our flesh. And what Paul is saying is that willpower and simple desire to follow the law and rules is powerless in producing holiness and obedience in our life. Throughout life, there is a conflict between the new nature that we find underneath the cross and the old nature. There's this conflict between the new nature that now we walk in and the old nature which is sinful that we've all been born with. That is why Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he, he looks at his disciples and he says, hey listen, pray lest you fall in temptation. And I Think about that. He's saying to Peter, who's later going to deny him three times, and this is right before Jesus goes to the cross to pay for our sin. He says, pray lest you fall in temptation. Listen, the only way that you can overcome sin is if you go into the secret place and you pray. Because it's in prayer where you're going to encounter the living presence of God. And you're not going to have your own willpower to overcome sin. It's only in the presence of the Lord where his holiness dwells, where he refines you and he works on you. And he takes his fire and he burns away everything that is not of him. And so he says, pray lest you fall in temptation. Well, this next line he says, for the spirit is willing the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, don't we all find ourselves in that place? Lord, my, my spirit is willing. God, uh, uh, I want to fast, God. I, 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 I want to turn from sin. I no longer want to look at pornography, God. I no longer want to fall and in, 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 in fall into the trap of gluttony. I no longer want to have this pride issue in my life, God. Lord, my, 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 my spirit is willing, but my flesh, God, it, it's incredibly weak. Would you help me? Again, it's only found in the secret place. It's only found when you spend time with the Lord. That's how, that's the only way you can do it. There is a way to overcome sin. 
If there wasn't, then why would James say this, that you would be hearers of the word? I'm sorry, you would be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word, right? You'd be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So what does it mean to be doers of the word and not just hearers of the word? It means this, it means radical obedience, church, yeah? It means radical obedience. So I looked at the Greek word for obedience and uh, I have a hard time pronouncing so I'm not even going to try. <laughs> but it means this, obedience literally means hearing under. Hearing under. We hear with a heart that comes under the authority of God's word and what he speaks. When God speaks, we submit to his authority and we obey. What does this look like? I think of the wedding of Cana. Yeah? Where Mary says to the servants, just do whatever he says to do. It's just taking what the Lord says to do and what? Doing it. Just do it. Just do it. We are servants. Yeah? We're servants. Servants don't ask why. Servants don't say, Lord, there might be a better way of doing it. Servants don't question anything. They just do it. And we as servants of the Most High God, when the Lord speaks and tells us to do something, we have to be able to be so sensitive to his voice because we spend time with him that now we just do it. We just do it. We don't ask questions. We just do it. Look at this, 1 John 5, 2 through 3. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. Say, keep his commandments. Come on, say it again. Keep his commandments. And watch this. I love this next part. And his commandments are not burdensome. The closer you get to God, the more obedient you must be. And the crazy thing, though, is obedience doesn't feel like this pressure thing. Obedience doesn't feel like Man, we think, the world thinks, man, those Christians, those people who follow the Lord, man, they have no fun. But listen, in, in the presence of the Lord, when we walk with him, there's fullness of joy. And it is fun at that point because out of our relationship with him, it is fun being obedient and listening to his every word. It is not a burdensome thing. It is not this thing of pressure. You see, when you've grown in your relationship with Jesus, you will have less desire for the flesh. It's why he must increase and we must decrease. John 3.30, he must increase, but I must decrease. Can you just say that right now? He must increase, but I must decrease. One more time. He must increase, but I must decrease. I see this principle in the life of Moses. Moses knew the ways of God. He had this intimate friendship with the Lord. He knew the ways of God. And this elementary level of obedience was not good enough for Moses any longer. There was a different level of obedience that Moses had to walk in as he was leading Israel and as he was having this deep, intimate relationship with his father. I think about when the glory of God passed by Moses, the level of obedience he needed to have. Let's look at this. Exodus 33. God tells him, listen, Moses, I want you to hide behind the rock. I'm going to let my glory pass by you. Because if you look at my face, you might die. The level of obedience that was, Moses was called into was a different level. Do you imagine disobeying God at that moment? He died. Look at this, verse 20. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here's a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, and my face shall not be seen. 
Now, is there anything sinful in this moment about Moses looking behind the rock? No, there's not anything inherently sinful about it. Now, just do disobedience from God when God told him to do something. You see, there's a different level of obedience that we're called into once we go into a deeper relationship with the Lord. Be like Moses. Get close to God. Get close to God in the secret place. And then obey every word that he says because the closer you get to God, the more obedient we must be. So to encourage you this morning, I want to give you Four results of radical obedience. Four results of radical obedience. And I'm sure there's more than this. Here's the four. Number one, radical obedience leads to favor. Isn't that good to know? I'm okay with favor. I don't know about y'all. I don't want to be too religious to say I don't want no favor from God. I want some favor from the Lord. Radical obedience leads to favor. Isaiah 66 2. But on this one will I look. But on this one will I look. On him who is poor and of a contrite spirit. Basically, him who is humble and who trembles at my word. God has favor and a deep affection on the people who are devoted to radical obedience and who walk in humility. That next part, it says, trembles at his word. This Hebrew word for tremble, it means this, it means in awe or reverence. Just as we sang this morning, holy, 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 God, you're holy. It's the recognition that God is holy. If you don't recognize God's holiness, don't really have a full grasp of it. I mean, uh, none of us can really fully grasp it. You need to go re- read Revelation chapter 4. Just read that and look at the holiness of God. But it means all in reverence. It takes a perspective of reverence to walk in holiness and obedience, doesn't it? So to tremble at his word, it means four things. We desire to hear his word. We're excited to understand his word. We bow before his authority and we're diligent to act on it. I want to give you for those four things again. We desire to hear it. We're excited to understand it. We bow before its authority and we're diligent to act on his word. When we tremble for his word like this, God draws close to us and has favor on us. I don't know about you, but man, I want the favor of God in my life, and I want the favor of God to rest on this church, yeah? Those who have a contrite heart and who tremble at his word, the second result of radical obedience is this. Radical obedience leads to greater intimacy. John 14, 21, he who has my commands and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Listen, obedience is a doorway to the closeness of God. When we are obedient to the Lord, what does the passage say? What is the promise of God right here? He will manifest himself to us. When we are obedient, we will know him on a deeper level, a deeper understanding. Why? Because he's holy and we have to be holy as he is holy. And he can draw near to those who are holy. As we set ourselves apart, we set ourselves aside. As we turn from sin and turn from our wicked ways, what does he do? He will manifest himself to us. How many of you desire the manifest presence of God in your life? That's what I want. The manifest presence of God, the knowing that he's there, that you'll walk into a room and like we carry something. We carry the very presence of God within us. If you are saved, if you are saved, you've given your life to Jesus, you carry the Holy Spirit inside of you. 
And if you spend time with him, what ends up happening is out of your mouth and will flow rivers of living water. He fills you up to the point to where you're just overflowing everywhere you go and people just know about it. And what they end up doing is they sense the manifest presence of God because you know him and you spend time with him. Isn't it a wonderful, amazing, beautiful thing? I want that in my life. I pray that in your life as well. You see, our love for Jesus is imperfect, isn't it? Our love for Jesus is imperfect, but what he rewards us with is his perfect love. His love is perfect, and he is rewarder to us. He gives us his perfect love. So love for Jesus is not stoic obedience. It's obedience out of relationship. Elementary obedience is just doing something because someone said to do it. But there comes a different level of obedience with the Lord as you develop this relationship. You're doing it from a place of love. My kids, in the beginning when they were, when they were young, I had to teach them, you're just going to do what I say to do because I tell you to do it, right? But as I grow in a relationship with them, they want to obey me because they love me now. Not because I told them to do it. Are there moments where I have to put down and say, I told you to do it, I'm the dad, so you're going to do it anyways? Of course there are. But by and large, they just do what I tell them to do because we have this relationship now, right? I think our relationship with the Lord is the same way. We go in from this elementary level of obedience of just doing it because God said to do it to all of a sudden we're doing it out of love for Christ. Religion is garbage, y'all. And religion says just be legalistic and just do it because it's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to obey the law. But relationship says, I'm just going to do what the Lord's calling me to do and what he's telling me to do because I love him and I want this relationship with him, yeah? And that's the difference right here. We're doing it out of love for him, out of love for God. So obedience leads to intimacy with him. The third result of radical obedience is radical obedience provides an unshakable foundation. <laughs> Isn't that good to have an unshakable foundation? Look at this, Jesus is talking, he says this in Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. Look at verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them is a wise man who built his house on a rock. Listen, Jesus acknowledges here that whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, whether you walk in obedience or you walk in disobedience, no matter what, you're going to encounter storms in life. I think we can all agree with that. You're going to encounter difficulty in life. But the question is, will you be able to uh, withstand the wind? Will you be able to withstand the waves that are coming against you in life? Because if you were obedient to his word and you're obedient to the Lord, you're going to have a strong foundation. And when the winds come and the rains come and the, and the waves come against you, you're going to be able to withstand. And not only will you withstand, you're going to have joy in the middle of the storm. You're like, man, I've got God. I've been obedient. He's going to carry me through. It's an incredible benefit to be obedient to his word because there are moments where regardless of where you're at, you're going to encounter storms. In this life, we will encounter storms. You will find trouble, right? But take heart. But take heart because God can help you overcome. But you've got to walk in obedience. The fourth result of radical obedience, radical obedience leads to rapid repentance. I love this one. <laughs> Radical obedience leads to rapid repentance. Repentance, it starts here. David wrote this. I meditate within my heart and my spirit makes diligent search. You know, there's things in life because none of us have arrived where we've got to have that heart. There's this place of 
constant search within us for the things that are not of God because we all have them. David constantly searched his heart for the things that grieved the heart of God. May we have that same mindset of, Lord, where in my heart is not of you? Where, what places in my heart, God, are grieving you? Why? Because I want to please God and I want to know him more intimately. It's while you're in the secret place and you ask the Lord, as David did again here in Psalm 139, he writes this and says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting life. Let me remind you this morning that David, he was a man after God's own heart. It was said, God said about him that he was the apple of his eye. The apple of his eye simply just meaning he had the favor of God. He was a man after God's own heart and he had the favor of God. He had those two things. But yet his sin was great. Think about what he did. He lied. He committed adultery and tried to cover it up by committing murder. Yet, <laughs> I don't understand it, yet, but I do understand it. Yet, God says about him, he's a man after my heart. He's the apple of my eye. In other words, he is a favor of God. Why? Because David quickly repented. He quickly repented. It takes humility to quickly repent. And so back to Paul, I do the things I don't want to do, but yet I still do them. My, my spirit is willing, but Lord, my, my flesh is weak. There's going to be moments where we fall, and we fall short of the glory of God. It is going to happen in this life. But what happens is we have to be people who quickly repent. This is not fun, is it? We have to be people who quickly repent. Lord, let me say this, grace. Grace is not a license to sin. Grace, the grace of God and what he did on Calvary, what he did on the cross is a license to no longer sin. It is in his mercy that he shows you the places in your heart that are not of him. And it is his grace that allows you to overcome that sin that we walk in and we go through. And if we just blatantly just continue to walk in sin, it's as if we are disrespecting the cross and disrespecting what he did for us on Calvary. How can he be near to someone like that? We might get to heaven. We might get to heaven. We're missing out on everything else in this life, and I believe in the next as well. Or would you help us? Yeah. He gives us the grace to overcome it. If you need to go read about grace, I encourage you to go to Romans chapter 6. I don't have time this morning. Go to Romans chapter 6. Read the first few verses. Look at the grace of God that allows you to overcome sin. We started with 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. My people call by my name, will humble themselves and pray. Seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. God spoke this to Solomon as he was building the temple. What happens is the glory of God comes in as they're dedicating the temple to the Lord. The glory of God shows up. Musicians can no longer play. Something incredible happens in that moment. And they, and they, and they say this, he, he is good and his mercy endures forever. They begin to sing that, they begin to say that as he is good and his mercy endures forever. Look how powerful the verses before 2 Chronicles 7.14 are and the verses after. As we close, I want to read this together. I have heard your prayer. This is God speaking. And I have chosen this place for myself as a house 
of sacrifice. Reminds me of the Lord, what does he ask us to do? To lay down our lives as living sacrifice before him. We're putting our lives down upon his altar and we're inviting him to come in and to examine us and to take away everything else that is not of him. I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command a locust to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now look at verse 15. Now my eyes, this is another result of it, now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. As for you, if you walk before me as your father David walked, for he talked about how his father David walked with humility, he repented quickly and do according to all that I have commanded you. And if you keep my statues and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom. What an incredible promise God gives Solomon. There's really four of them right here that he gives to Israel. He'll forgive their, their sins. He'll hear their land. God's eyes will be open and ear attentive to prayer. And his glory will perpetually dwell among the people. And now the results of King Solomon and his obedience would be his throne is established. We all know how Solomon ended. He started off really well, but man, he ended poorly. We'll find out later, man, he's not obedient. He worships other gods. He does other things. He's not true to this promise that God told him. The temple's destroyed. About to read about that in a moment. Here's the thing the wages of sin is death. God gives us, though, a free gift, and that is eternal salvation with Him. The wages of sin, though, is death. Let me tell you this. When you were there are consequences, the consequences for unbelievers is hell. That's the consequences for the unbeliever. There are, but there are also consequences for the believer if we are disobedient. I want to give you a couple of different consequences. When we as believers are disobedient, it quenches the Holy Spirit ministry through us. It robs us of joy. It robs us of our peace. Isn't it, when you think about it, isn't it incredibly miserable as a believer to live in sin? I've discovered that in my own life. It is miserable to be a believer and live in sin. The fourth thing, it hinders our fellowship with God. It causes a feeling of separation from God. You see, there are consequences to sin because we will reap what we sow. Galatians 6, 7 says this, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. We will reap what we sow. If you're feeling any type of way, you're feeling like, man, the Holy Spirit in my ministry is, is just doesn't feel like it's powerful, it's not working. If you feel like, man, I don't have any joy, I don't have, don't have peace, if it, you feel like your relationship with the Lord, there's something there and it's, it's hindering it, I'm just asking you this morning, man, examine your own heart. Find out if there's any evil way within you. Because again, we all have sin, including myself. Back to Second Chronicles as we end. Verse 19. Here's what God tells Solomon here. But, here comes the result of sin. But if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and you go and you serve other gods and you worship them, 
Then I will uproot them from my land, which I have given them in this house, which I have sanctified for my name. I will cast out of my sight and will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. And as for this house, which is exalted, everyone who passes it will be astonished and say, why has the Lord done thus to this land and this house? Then they will answer, because they forsook for, for, for Sook. They, because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who brought them out of the land of Egypt and embraced other gods and worshiped them and served them. Therefore, he has brought all this calamity on them. That's the result of sin. We must be people of obedience that we would be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. We must be people of quick Repentance, often repenting that we would follow the Lord to search his heart, to turn from sin, to turn towards God. That God would give us love and a reverence and a holy fear. Would God give us a reverence and a holy fear? That's my prayer this morning for you, that God would give you a reverence for him and a holy fear, a holy fear. What is the fear of the Lord? It is to be terrified of being outside of his presence. That we would be terrified not to be close to the Lord because it is the relationship that we cherish more than any other relationship. So I'm inviting you this morning because when we look at this, this series, Why Revival Waits, again, God's, we're not waiting on God to bring revival. He's waiting on us. And I believe this morning that what he's asking us to do is to search our own hearts. We all have stuff, don't we? To examine our own hearts, really examine it. And then invite the holy fire of God to come and burn up everything that is not of him. That we be people of quick repentance who have a humble heart. Would you rise with me? I want to read this again. Psalm 139, 23. After I got done reading this, I don't want to really say anything else. I just want to get out of the way, let the Holy Spirit do his thing. The band's going to sing a song. This is what I want to invite you to do. We've got a little bit of time. Some of you in this room, you might need to kneel at your seat. Some of you in this room, you need to come up to these altars. You need to repent. Maybe in this room, you just need to sit down at your seat. I don't know, I don't want, but I don't want your seats to withhold you from walking in the fullness of what God has done for you. I think the majority of people, they need to come to these altars and repent including myself. So I want to read this passage and then I invite you to respond. So as we read this, I want you to really examine yourself. This is what I believe is some of you, you've partnered with spirits that are not of God. You've been partnered with demonic spirits. You've opened doors to things in your life that you've been held back for so long you can't find freedom. But where you find freedom is in repentance. Believe at the feet of Jesus there's freedom, right? 
presence of God, there's freedom. But I believe it was on the other side of weeping and mourning and, and crying when you're completely disgusted with your sin and you come before the Lord and you repent, around on the other side of that church, there's joy. It's not necessarily a day of joy, but I believe what the Lord's gonna do is you're gonna restore joy in your life again. But there has to be this humility and repentance. So I'm gonna read this. I'm gonna come down here to the altars and I'm gonna pray. And I invite you to do the same. Psalm 139, 23. Can we actually just, I wanna read this. I feel like this is, I wanna read this three times. I feel like the Lord's is impressing upon my heart right now. I wanna read this three, three times, but I wanna do it together, out loud. Okay, three times together, everyone. Verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way of everlasting. Again, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way of everlasting. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way of everlasting.